Hello again. Today we're going to try out a little experiment. We're going to show you a piece of tape, but we've altered it a little bit. And we want to see how much information you lose in the middle section. You'll see a piece, and a middle piece, and a, an end piece. And you'll see that Jerry's handsome face has been covered up. OK, just watch it and see what you get. Well, you've probably already guessed why we did that. A lot of people think that sign language is just waving our hands about, and it's all concentrated in the hands. And as we've said many times before, that's not true. So what we want to begin to look at is what information are we getting from the face and the rest of the body. 
In fact, in particular, we're going to concentrate today on the face. If we look at the first part of that piece, before the face is blotted out, we can see that the face was giving us different kinds of information. You might have noticed that when he's talking about the boat cutting through the water, he used a stretch mouth pattern. And that shows the intensity of the movement, the strength of the movement, the difficulty of the boat going through the water. And then we saw him, Jerry, turn away as a big wave came towards him. And he looked up at the wave. And so the movement of the head, the eye direction, gives us information which is crucial to understanding what's actually going on in the signing. Then we saw his head bouncing back. And the puffed cheeks add that emphasis to tell us how terrible the wave and the strength of the wave was. You may notice as well another example of puffed cheeks when he shows the boat going down and up again through the waves. And when the waves were coming over the boat, So you've got some idea of what, from what I've said about the kind of information that we lose if we lose the face. We can't see the face. So now we want you to watch this piece again. But this time we want you to look carefully at the face that you now can see. We've taken away the black spot. So watch it carefully and see what information you're getting. We came round the side of the French coast and we sailed on. It was getting dark and it was around eight o'clock and we were going deeper into the trough and up and the boat would sit on the wave and then go in deeper, more and more, and then out again. And I looked through binoculars and the waves were getting higher and higher and we went down and I looked up and I was holding onto the steering wheel I'd lost control and the boat was just going up through the wave and water came all over us and knocked my head back pushed me back I tried to control but I was thinking of the people inside the cabin it was worse for them than for the helmsman it wasn't bad for him it might break their neck that's all but what about them they were rolling all over the place in the cabin we'd lost control and the boat was just cutting through the water I saw rocks on my left I couldn't navigate. We had to carry on. The waves were just pushing us through and it was getting darker and the clouds were rushing across. There was rain and wind. It was really strong. We went on and on. The boat just kept going up. We hit on the top of the wave. We were just going too fast. There was no control and we juddered down into the trough. That felt great. I wanted some more. But the boat was actually cutting into the wave and water would pour all over the deck and the next wave would be bigger. And I thought that would be the last one, but no, it just carried on from 9, 10, 11 o'clock. Just carried on, holding on at the helm. And the boat would go on through. The waves were getting bigger, and I'd look up. And we were right in the middle. It was beautiful in the middle. There was no wind. It was above the waves. So we would just try and cut through the troughs, and water would pour all over the deck. And it was like floating. Anyway, I banged on the deck for a deaf person to come out and help me, but it was too late. The water just poured into the, into the cabin and they rolled all over the place and they looked out and I asked and the deaf people were panicking and they were holding on desperately. That we couldn't sign and communicate. I wanted the boat to go one way and the boat was being pushed the other and I told a deaf man to lash the sail. No, he refused and others refused. So I told a deaf man to come and take over from me. Come on! and he had to crawl out just a short distance and he was pulling himself out and I was trying to pull him towards me. I couldn't pull him just easily and the boat was going up and I, I had no harness on. 
I'd opened it for him to take over from me. So I was pulling myself and the boat was just cutting at different angles and the water was pouring all over the deck and the deaf man was shouting. Anyway, I said, you take over yourself and learn yourself. And I went down into the cabin. What in the hell? What could I do? There was water pouring all over the, the floor. I said, why, why is it? Why has it happened? And a hearing man came towards me. His hair was standing on end, literally standing on end. I pushed him back. Don't come this way, because when the boat's going up, you'll knock me out through the cabin. No, you'll knock me out. So I held on, and he was coming towards me, and I was pushing him back. And then the boat would go down, and he stumbled back and hit his head. But he hit his head on soft seats and just lay there. His face, their eyes were staring. I couldn't carry on. Anyway, I was patient and determined, and I wanted to navigate. Pencil and compass were under the water somewhere. I couldn't find them. I wanted the compass for navigating, to find out roughly where we were. And I came out again, and the wind was strong, and we couldn't breathe. When we're able to see the face, we're able to get a lot more information. Let's take the sign, look up. We know that it's looking up from the way that the hands change. But we don't really get the idea that the person was looking around. We get that information from the head and the way it moves. One of the most interesting examples in this piece is this example. Now you probably can see that my hand went right off the screen. And perhaps you're wondering what my hand was doing. Now I know, and other people know what my hand is doing, from the information they're getting from the face. Because that sign needs this mouth pattern. And this shh gives us the information that something is there, that something is present, so that we know up there was the wind I've brought my hand down to show you the actual movement. You'll have noticed as well, there are several ways that we can show intensity. So we can have the steering wheel being turned, with stretched lips, or with puffed cheeks. There was another sign there, this one. And there are many signs like this which are difficult to translate. You can't do that with that without facial expression. Sorry, without facial expression. You can't do it like that. It has no meaning. You have to give the facial expression. And you can see that it's difficult to translate. And we might translate it as... Uh, what? What are we going to? Something like that. But listen to the voice translation when you see the full extract. OK. Now we're going to give some explanation of how we think non-manual features work in the language. Let's look first of all at the two main types two main groups, non-manual features. What do we mean by that big heading, non-manual features? Well, fairly obviously, we mean all that body movement that's not the hand. So it might be the shoulders, might be the whole head, it might be the mouth, or the cheeks, or the eyes. As you can imagine, there are a lot of different variations that one can make, and a lot of different combinations. So you can have your head down, and eyes closed. Or my head up 
my eyes up, and my mouth may be open. So what we're going to try to do in the next couple of apes is to look at some of the different uses those non-manual features have in the language. In fact, there are many different uses of non-manual features. They can be used to show questions in sign language, to show negatives, they can be used and show the beginning and the end of a sentence, and they can also show the topic of a sentence. But for the moment we're going to ignore all of that and we're going to concentrate on individual signs. And we're going to look at two different groups. The first group is what we call multi-channel signs. What that means is that these signs normally must have both a hand, both the hands and the face combined. So in the graphic you saw the sign. Now if I did that without using the facial expression that means absolutely nothing. And deaf people would say, what are you talking about? It's, it's a load of rubbish. But if I add the information, the facial information, it's clearly a recognizable sign. So that's an example of what we call a multi-channel sign. The other group is what we call non-manual modifications. You see there that we've used the sign in the graphic for object. Now it's possible to do that sign in a different number of different ways. I don't have to use puff cheeks, but in the graphic you saw that we were using puff cheeks to emphasize, I really object. Now that's a modification, something added from the face to that manual sign, to the sign itself. It gives us extra information about that sign. And what we're going to see in the examples in the rest of this tape Signs that we might know already, like work or talk, can be changed by adding information from the face. Actually, most of those examples we're going to look at in the second tape on non-manual features. But in the rest of this tape, we're going to look mainly at what's called multi-channel signs. And now I think I'll ask Jerry to explain and demonstrate some examples. This means it's as if there's a deaf person there and he's very worried about his exams, which he's just going to take. Come on, it'll be easy. It'll be okay. There's plenty of time, don't worry. But another example, another example with this facial expression, it means they're going to play football against a very strong team. It'll be okay. Just take your time. This means there's no need to worry. 
Be calm. You're going to meet somebody who's a very important person. Don't worry, just take your time, be calm. With this facial expression, it means maybe you're going to play darts in a dance competition and you're playing a really skilled player and I'll say, look, it'll be okay, I'll, I'll beat him. This means that somebody was explaining to me that they've been walking in the mountains, very high in the mountains. Wow, I couldn't do that. This is... I'm looking around at the weather and it's really horrible. It's cold and damp. It's horrible. Oh, the meal that I'm about to have, is, it's horrible. I don't want it. I've got lots of money, bags of money. You have? Yes, I have. Lots of money. Ugh, why did you swallow that story? I have five children, and now they've all joined the Air Force. They're flying all... You believe me? Why did you believe me? Um, I'm asking a deaf person. You've been looking for a job? Me looking for a job? No, I can't be bothered. Oh. I saw you pick my trousers. I haven't. I haven't. Sometimes I'm in the kitchen cooking and I'm looking around. Where's the knife? It's, lay it's lying down somewhere and I'm searching for it and somebody says to me, there it is. Oh, it was staring me in the face. It means if somebody is signing for a long time, talking for a long time, you're a blether. It's as if there's a group of deaf people and we're out having a great time. And most of us are married and our wives are in another place and we're celebrating and then suddenly the wives come in. We think, oh, that's terrible and we change to Coca-Cola. It makes us look so good. It makes us look as though we're not really celebrating. Deaf people were talking and we were saying about the doctors, they're working so hard and so busy, they're dedicated and patient. I was in a car driving on the motorway and there was a 70, 80 miles per hour and I ignored the speed limit and then suddenly what happened? A police car came in front of me. I was talking with my wife and she was telling me that she'd been trying to meet and see her friend who she hadn't seen for a long time. And then one day, a few days later, we went into the deaf club. We were walking along and then she tapped me on the shoulder. That's her, that's her. At last I've seen her. That's my friend. Oh, I said, that's her. And I shook her hand. Americans have been trying to have detente with Russia 
And the detente was succeeded? No, they'd been trying and had very hard discussions for a long period of time. And it, you can use this sign with puff cheeks. In our football match, we had been attacking the other goal. And after the match had finished, oh, we said, we were really trying for such a long time to get a goal. It's OK. Is the bus coming? Yes, it's just coming any moment. Yeah, and I ran and caught it. And another way of using this sign with a different facial expression. For example, I'd been waiting for a letter that I'd posted and you hadn't replied. Don't worry, I'm going to send it at any time. I was walking around the shops and I looked and I couldn't believe my eyes. There was 500 pounds lying there. Deaf person, he said that he wanted to become a professional footballer. I said, no, you can't, you can't. But one year later, I saw on television and in the newspaper, and I was absolutely flabbergasted. He had become a professional footballer. I was walking along, and I met another deaf person. Oh, he said, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. I said, what? He said, there's another deaf person. He's got a Rolls Royce. I said, what? And then I looked, and yes, the Rolls Royce drew up, and my mouth dropped open. I went to an air display, an airfield, and I was looking at the display. And two planes went so close to each other, and I thought, oh, how terrible, they nearly crashed. I've never been to America before in my life. So I flew and arrived and landed in New York. And I couldn't believe it, the incredibly high, tall buildings. There's an artist, and he'd done his artwork, and it was so precise. It was exactly the same as a photograph. My bedroom is terrible, it's very untidy. But in the morning, I opened my door and it was clean and spick and span. It was perfect. You remember before that I signed in this way, but now here's another one where the facial expression is different. Deaf person was explaining to me that he'd been to Ben Nevis walking in Ben Nevis, and he'd fallen quite a distance. And I looked at him, and he said, I fell, and I got up, and I said, oh, wow, I couldn't have done that. You are lucky. There are two ways of doing this sign. If I start with that, it's similar to the verb to be. Like, for example, someone says to me, Is he there? Is he there? And I respond, Yes, he is there. OK? Another way is if you want to show emphasis. Yes, he definitely is there. He is definitely there.
Maybe I've been looking for somebody desperately, and I say to another deaf person, where is he? I haven't seen him. And they say, yes, he's there. He is definitely there somewhere. You'll see mostly this sign created in different places is to show the direction and the place. Like, for example, I'm talking about the Americans at the moment are worried about what to do about Russia. And that's happening there at the moment, is to show how far away it's happening at the present time. There's a football match. It's actually happening now, at this moment. If I say that I have a sore stomach, I can show that it's there. And it shows you the position of the sore stomach. It's happening now. I said that I'd heard that you'd bought tickets for the football match at Hampden Park, Scotland versus England. I heard you bought tickets. Oh, I haven't got any. Oh, you haven't got any? No, I haven't got any. Two deaf people were arguing and arguing, and I said, what's it about? Ah, what really happened was that he thought he had stolen his money, and he had thought he had stolen his money, but it had been somebody else who had stolen the money. I'd been searching for a house, and there was a beautiful house. I was talking to a deaf friend. I nearly bought that house, but it fell through because somebody offered a higher price. I was so disappointed. He looked at me and said, Ah, I nearly bought one very close to it. We would have been next door. That would have been great. One of the problems for hearing people about this whole area is it can be really difficult to see the examples and get hold of them especially if we don't know the meaning of the sign or the role of that particular non-manual feature. So if we look at the last example that Jerry gave us, the example of... It can be easy for hearing people not to realize that that has a meaning in the language and just ignore it and don't bother with it. Understand part, ignore the sign, and then understand the rest. If hearing people do ignore it, they're losing some information and can distort the language. So let's have a look at a little story from Maureen when she actually uses that sign. I think you'll enjoy the story. She's talking about the first visit of her parents-in-law for tea, dinner, or tea. Now, I th I'm going to give you a little bit of help and tell you exactly what to look for. The first example of is when she says, the oven could have gone on fire. But what she actually signs is, so, is giving us, this sign is giving us the information that it could have happened, but it didn't happen. And the second time she uses it is when she tells us, and she's telling her father-in-law, and she says to him, it could have spoiled dinner. It would have been a lousy dinner. And he's looking. It could have been. So the sign is giving us all that information. Now look for yourselves. 
and see if you can get it. See if you can get those two signs. Now, we were expecting his mother to come. I went into his flat. It was awful. You know a man on his own can't keep a flat tidy. He really needs a woman there. So I tidied it up, made it spick and span for his mother coming. He said, my mother often comes. I said, no, let's make it nice. What are we going to make for them to eat? Um, he said, I don't know. Fish and chips, Chinese, something light. I said, that's not nice. I must cook something. They're driving a long way. OK, please yourself. So I bought a steak pie. He had an oven, there were four rings, and two grills. Now, I made the vegetables, prepared the potatoes, and I went for the pie. I said, is the oven working? He said, yes, but it must have completely slipped his mind. So, I went to open the oven door, and I nearly collapsed at the sight. There were piles of books jammed into the oven. I thought, wait till Clark comes home. Back he marched into the house. I said, where do you keep your books? He said, well, it's piles in the cupboards or in the drawers. I said, you keep them in the oven, you idiot. If I'd lit the oven, they could have been burned. Oh, I've forgotten, he said. So he cleared them out. I was annoyed at the time, but afterwards I chuckled to myself. Then his mother came. The lights flashed. I opened the door. Mother came in and father, and they sat down. I served the meal. Mother said, that's the first time I've had a cooked meal. I was on tenterhooks. I couldn't join into the conversation. I really hope they're enjoying their meal. I sat and watched, making sure everything was all right. Then we chatted away. And everything seemed to go well. And later, Father said, that was a great meal. I said, yes, but it could have been spoiled. Why? Because your son keeps books in the oven. Father nearly lost his head. <gasps> well, don't give up. You will find in the end that it becomes easier and easier to see and recognize these multi-channel signs. We're going to finish again with another example of the same sign. But this time we're not going to give you any clues. Well, I'll tell you, it doesn't come at the beginning of the piece and it doesn't come in the middle, so it must be at the end. So watch and see if you can get it. See if you can get hold and get hold of the exact idea of what the face is doing and how that's part of the sign. And also what the meaning of is in that context. We'll be looking at more examples of the face in the next tape. So remember this time, turn off the sound and watch it first without sound. OK, bye. See you in the next tape. Yes. Do you mean... Oh, yeah. Oh, it was fantastic. A beautiful story. A deaf man was telling me and I, I just couldn't believe it. It was fantastic. What had happened was... He was telling me himself that he'd been at the deaf club and he'd been drinking, having a great time. He'd drinking heavily, drinking many pints. And then he was drunk and he waved farewell and walked down the road to George Square in Glasgow. And you can get a late bus there. It was, he was really staggering all over the place, falling down and getting up and anyway, he wanted the last bus and he was peering through fuddled eyes and... Anyway, the driver looked at him and said, OK, probably knew him, and he went upstairs and sat down, and he was feeling quite ill, and he collapsed. He blacked out. Oh, he blacked out. So I looked at him and said, tell me more, tell me more. So anyway, time moved on, and he woke up, and there were lights flashing across the top of his head. He said, what are they? Anyway, he flashed again, and I looked at him again and said, what's it about? So. He woke up again, and he was in bed, lying in bed. Last time I was on the bus. Then the next thing I can remember are these lights flashing across the top of my head. And now I'm in bed. Then he recognized straight away, it was immediately that he was in a hospital, the smell of a hospital. And he said, what is it? The doctor came. He said, are you all right? He said, I'm deaf. The doctor said, oh, no, you're deaf. What is, what's it about? We thought you might have been unconscious or... 
And then they found out what really had happened when he collapsed in the bus. He had a fallen and somebody had tried to resuscitate him and spoken to him and he'd just lain there and they'd panicked.